believe in encounters with God at this church, not just encounters with man. Uh, I'm not up here to perform for you or give you a TED talk. Uh, I, I, I'm not good enough of a speaker for that. Uh, I'm here to just get out of the way enough and present his word the best I can. And uh, it's been reading me all week, his word. And so I'm going to read it to you. And uh, my prayer is that you understand it and then that you stand under it. Uh, because it is a sure foundation. I got any people that, that believe that out there? It's a sure foundation. You ready to open his word? If you got your Bibles, we're going to jump around different things, but I just encourage you, uh, if you can't get there in time, we'll try to throw it on the screens. Um, but also maybe just write it down and utilize that as your notes. Uh, this week, we do send out an email uh, from church on a devotion and kind of a a synopsis of the message so you can kind of take your week and continue to chew on it and go deeper. Uh, don't just take what I say. Go see it for yourself. Go grow in it yourself. Amen. We got some, we got some mature believers out there that are not just needing someone to feed them, but they, they, hey, they, they know how to eat themselves and, and how to grow themselves. So uh, we're going to start in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22. Galatians 5, 22. Um, and would you stand for the reading of the word? Would you stand up? And we'll, we'll do this. Uh, Pastor Israel started this. We'll keep it going. Let's go. Um, how many guys enjoyed Israel here a couple weeks ago? How many guys enjoyed Pastor Christy? Pastor Israel, Pastor Christy. How many guys enjoyed Pastor David? Come on. Awesome. Let's go. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, by contrast, the fruit, come on, read it with me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and there is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and Desires. Now stay standing on your feet. I'm going to have you read one more. Luke chapter 13, verse 6. Do we have this one? Luke 13, verse 6. I hope so. There we go. Amazing. Amazing. Let's read this one together. You ready? One, two, three. Then Jesus told this story. He came by again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Come on. Somebody say, give it one more chance. <laughs> Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of poop. Fertilizer. I'll give it plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. Come on, somebody say, cut it down. <laughs> he says this. I, I love this. I, I, think, I think we'll title the sermon this. Give it one more chance. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, neighbor. Give it one more chance. You ready for one more chance? I need one more chance. Anybody else need one more chance? <laughs> Sir, the gardener asked that you give it one more chance. And if you uh, know anything about this, you know that the gardener is Jesus. And the gardener is asking, Father God, I know this fruit, this tree has not produced fruit. I don't know if we got any trees out there that are barren that haven't produced fruit in a while, but there's been seasons of my life where I'm looking and there's no fruit and I'm so thankful for Jesus because if it wasn't for the gardener, I wouldn't be here today. Come on, everybody thankful for give it one more chance. Give it one more chance. Come on, would you celebrate and you can give someone a high five. Be seated. We're talking about the fruit of the spirit. We're talking about the fruit of love and, uh, We've kind of laid this out for you in the past couple of messages, starting with the one I preached, that if you were to read this in, in proper uh, Hebrew, proper Greek, uh, you would discover that, that the word 
fruit is singular, not plural. So when he gives us this verse, many modern takes, just reading it at face value, would think, oh, there's a whole bunch of fruit that's going to be produced in my life, and it's going to be love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, generosity. It's going to be these things that are going to be produced in my life when I get plugged into God. When I receive God, here's going to be the evidence of that receiving in my life. And that is true, but what isn't true is that it's multiple fruits. Really, if we look at the original language, it's a singular fruit. So it's the fruit of the first word, which is love. And all of these other things are the attributes of love. Just like an apple has a core, has seeds, has a skin, has the meat. All of them are the apple. They're just attributes of the apple. Does that make sense? And so we're looking at this. The juicy fruit of God is really one fruit with a whole bunch of attributes. Uh, we, we, we said, uh, you know, patience is love's response. Um, joy is love's celebration. And so when you get the fruit of love in your life, which uh, we know that God doesn't have love, he is love. And so when you get God in your life, you have love. And so you, because you have love, you also We'll have, okay, thank you for that. I was just trying to make it up off the top of my head. And here we go. Joy is love's celebration. Peace is love's reward. Patience is love's response. Kindness is love's action. Generosity is love's gift. Faithfulness is love's commitment. Gentleness is love's comfort. And self-control is love's discipline. Leave that up. Take a picture of that. Screenshot that. Put that on your, put that on your screenshot if you want. Right there, I'll duck. Or I'll just be in your screenshot with you right there. And... Um, this is a good, good thing to look at daily and say, okay, if I have love, these are the things I have. This, we know that the most important thing is love. You can prophesy, you can heal the sick, you can do all these things. But if you don't have love, you're like a clanging cymbal or a crashing gong is what the Bible says. That's not the cymbals on a drum if the cymbals annoy you. I, I, I tend to like the cymbals. But what that is is they, when they would go into the Holy of Holies, the priest, once a year, they would tie cymbals onto their leg. And when they go into the Holy of Holies to present an offering before God, if there was any sin in their life. These, these crazy guys that would go in there, man, they'd stay up all night, just like, Lord, please let there not be any sin. When I was 15, I, I, I stole the Snickers bar from that counter. Father, forgive me when I, I lied. You know, and they're, they're trying to think of all the things so that when they go into the holies of holies, God's holiness won't destroy them. And so they would tie little symbols on their legs with a rope. And if they heard the symbols crash... They knew that the presence of God had killed the priest that went in there. And many times this happens, so they have to drag the priest out and get a new priest. Who's next? Who's next? And so the Bible says, without love, you don't make it in the presence of God. Who is love? Love is not a thing or a feeling. It's a person. Without Jesus, we don't make it in his presence. And so, so when we get Jesus, we get love. And when we get love, we get all these things. How awesome is that? Who doesn't want joy in their life? Who doesn't want gentleness and goodness and peace and generosity and self-control? These are great things. That, these are gifts. These are not rules. These are gifts that rule our life. Who, who's seen some of these things come to pass in their life? Who's seen some of these things, the outworkings of these things in their life? And so when we have love, we have all these things. I love this story in Luke because, you know, we're here to get planted in God's garden. This is God's garden, and, and he's watering us. And, uh, you know, his word is, is like water. It waters us. It transforms us. You may have come here as a seed, but God has been watering you. He's been developing roots in you. He's devel he's de maybe some of you are finally shooting through the surface. You've been growing down in X18 and, and serving and, 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 and coming faithfully, and you've been growing down. No one's seen your growth yet but you and God, and you're like, man, they don't even know, man. They don't even know that I couldn't even say a sentence without 18 cuss words. They don't even know that I, 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 was, I was coming to church high every week. They don't even know, man, that if you would have cut me off in the parking lot like the person did today, I would 
would have cut you down, baby. I, I've been strapped off. You know, they don't even know. They don't know my past. I've been growing. They haven't even seen my growth, but I see my growth. And you're growing down, you're growing down, and then all of a sudden you start growing up. People start seeing your growth. Wow. I, I've known you for so long. You're different. There's something different about you. You don't look like the seed anymore. You don't look like a dead weed anymore. You, 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 there's life in you. There's joy in you. There's, and all of a sudden, seeing things start growing. And, and the Bible says that the, 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 the God, the Father, or the owner of the, of the soil comes out. And the thing you need to know about God is he is a good steward. He's a good steward. He's a good owner. He's a faithful owner. And so he comes out to the, to the, to the, to the land that's there and he's inspecting the growth. He's inspecting the trees. And he said, look, this tree over here has been here for three years. It's a full grown fig tree. And, and, and what you need to know about fig trees is when they had leaves, they often had fruit. You remember the story in the Bible where Jesus goes over to a fig tree and he reaches his hand in to the leaves and he finds no fruit. And he goes, this tree is cursed. And they walk away, right? And they come back a couple of days later and the tree's shriveled and dead. Why, why was Jesus mad at the tree? Because it was advertising that it had fruit. But it didn't go past the advertisement. And so Jesus comes in the garden and he says, look at all these trees that are advertising. Wow, this looks good. I'm going to get in here and taste some of this fruit from the advertisement of, look at me. I'm all grown up and I'm all spread out. And he reaches in and he said, it's been three years and there's still no fruit. It's been 2,000 years since the upper room and still no fruit, no love, no peace, no joy, no patience, no kindness. It's been a long time. You are now grown. <laughs> that was a great word. He said, grown. <laughs> you are grown. And so Jesus comes in and says, hold on, God the Father. Give me one year. Give me one year. Give me one more chance. And let me tend to the leaves. Let me cut some things off. See, sometimes you thought when things were getting cut off, God was mad at you. He was frustrated at you. He was angry at you. But God has actually given you grace. He's cutting some things off so he can, he can help you produce some fruit. You got too many leaves. You got too many leaves and you need some room for the fruit. So he's, he's cutting some things off, some dead branches in you that are just taking up space. Come on, what, what God cut out of you, you didn't need anyways. You didn't need anyways. God, I'm talking about that friend that left you, that, that family member that never believed in you, that thing that you had that you thought you needed, that job you thought you needed, that paycheck you thought you needed, what God cut off in you, what God disallowed in you, you didn't need anyways. He, he cut it off because he's preparing you for growth. He said, give me, give me one more chance. Give me one one more year. Just give me a year to work with it. I know in three years we could produce something, nothing, but, but in one year with me, we can produce everything. And so he's going to do in one year what you couldn't do in three. And he's cutting. And he says, and he says don't forget, don't forget, apply fertilizer. We, we got to apply the fertilizer. What's the fertilizer? The manure. We got to put the manure in here because it's the manure that unlocks something special, some nutrient dense things in the tree that will ultimately produce fruit. I don't know who's been walking through manure in here. I don't know who's been getting cut in on. I don't know who's been going through times and seasons where you thought God had forgotten you, but the hand on your life is not the devil. The hand on your life that's applying the fer fertilizer is God giving you a second chance. So God doesn't rip you out. He said, you're taking up space. That space is valuable. If you won't produce there, I will remove you and put someone who will. Oh, it's hard teaching. 
God says, if you got invited to the wedding and you don't attend because you got other things to do, then I'm going to go out further. He sends the servant out further. He says, if they won't come, disinvite them and go out to the highways and the byways. And if there's not enough there, go out to the hedges and the holes and look for someone who wants to be in my house. And I praise God today because I'm one of those ones that was in the hedges and the holes. And God had passed a lot of other people who were just taking up space. And I'm not going to allow this ground to go unnoticed. I'm going to allow it to produce in me everything it's called. Come on, say, give it one more chance. Give it one more chance. Today I want to focus in on the aspect of the fruit of love called generosity generosity you may say today well i don't want to talk about generosity i want to talk about the gospel well you cannot talk about the gospel unless you talk about generosity my bible says for god so loved the world that he you can't remove the two you can't remove love from generosity They're one and the same. They're a part of the same fruit. If you have love, you have generosity. Let's say it like this. You can give without loving. You can give without loving. You can do it. Anybody can do it. The world does it. T-Mobile every Tuesday. Tuesday T-Mobile. They're going to give you and they do not love you. They're going to give you a free pizza Free McDonald's burger. I know that because one of my guys, he sends me the ads every week. I'm like, bro, I don't eat McDonald's. Come on, brother. (laughs) But maybe today, you know what I'm saying? They're going to give you stuff. You've been to a birthday party and given someone a gift because they got you a gift. You got to make sure it's equal. It's as special. You, You can give for a lot of reasons. You can give to be noticed. You can give to look rich. You, you can give for a lot of reasons. You can give for selfish motives. You can give someone because you have a lust for something they have. Ladies, I'll say it this way. Not every guy given to you loves you. They might lust you. Right? You can give without loving. You could give in lust where it really benefits you. But you can't love without giving. If you love, you will give. You will give yourself. You will give your life. You will give your all. God so loved that he gave. If you love, you'll be generous. And God didn't give us a brick from heaven or a broken angel with one wing He gave us his only son. The light of heaven was emptied so we could have the light on earth. You know, the Bible says there is no sun in heaven. Jesus is the light. Think about when he came to earth. The light was gone for a few years while we experienced the light that would light up our hearts. It's the gospel. It's the gospel to walk in this kind of of love. God's looking for generous believers. He's looking for believers that say, you know what, God, I want to give extravagantly. Look at this story with Mary Magdalene. The Bible literally says on the top of this verse, I'm about to read you in Luke chapter seven, verse 36, Jesus was anointed by a sinful woman. What a, what a rated R sermon right here. Jesus was anointed by a sinful woman. That's Luke chapter 7, verse number 36. It says this, when, the Pharise, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus, and I'm, I'm going to read for a little bit if that's okay. okay? So, so, you know, don't get on TikTok. Don't get on Instagram. Just stay focused. I'm going to read for a bit because I think sometimes we need to go deeper than a surface area, okay? And the only way to do that is to get, get the word in you. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Verse 37, a woman in that town who lived a what? So a whole sinful life, right? She didn't sin one time. She didn't sin a few times. Her whole life would be marked as sinful, okay? So, so, so if she could make it 
we can make it. Amen. A woman that was in the town that lived the sinful light learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees or the religious elite, these, the word Pharisee means separatist. That's the person that says, I'm perfect. I got this down. The cup is clean. But we know often the separatists look clean on the outside, but they ain't clean on the inside. Amen. Amen. Anybody ever met one of those? Maybe, maybe you look in the mirror and say, man, that's me. I'm, I'm struggling with that. The, the, the separatist, the Pharisee, sees this woman. And when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, this is his house, he said to himself, in his mind, if this man were a prophet, if he really were the son of God, he would know who is touching him. And what kind of woman she is. Funny thing is, I wonder how he knew what kind of woman she is. How he know? How he, how he know what kind of woman she is? If he only knew, oh, how'd you know? You ain't a prophet. Oh, you've been in the sneaky piggy. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you've been in. You know what kind of sin she's been doing because you've been doing it with her. Okay, I don't know. I'm not trying to judge the Pharisee and being a Pharisee myself, but hey amen. He stood behind her feet weeping, and Jesus answered him. So he doesn't speak out loud. He thinks this in his brain. Be careful what you think. <laughs> Jesus can hear you. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. So he looks at his disciple. He says, two people owed money. One, a certain money lender, owed him, owed him 500 denarii. The other... 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which one of them loved him more? Simon replied, I suppose it's the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured her perfume on my feet. You didn't do it to my head, but she did it to my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven loves. Whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. I want to read you a couple more. Uh, Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. Mark 14, verse 3. Do we have that one? Yes. Awesome. Mark 14, verse 3. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table of the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made with pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those who were present saying indignantly to each other, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wage and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing. The poor you will have with you always. You can help them at any time you want, but you will not always have me. She knew what time it was. She did what she could. She poured her perfume on my body before and prepared for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in her memory. And that's what we're doing here today. Amen? Okay. Good. One more. One more. John, chapter 12. So we're going all around. We, we started with Luke. 
So we got Luke's take. Luke is the Luke is is writing his story of what happened. Then then we got then we got Mark's take, and now we have John's take. Who wants to hear John's take? Okay, here we go. Good. I'm glad for you. Six days before the Passover, John chapter eleven verse one. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in honor. Uh, in Jesus' honor, Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of nard, an expensive perfume she had poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped her feet with his hair, with her hair. And the house was filled. Somebody said the house was filled with fragrance and perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, Judas, but because he was a thief as a keeper of the money bags and he used to help himself to what was put in it. Notice that the only disciple that had a problem with extravagant giving was Judas. I'll say that again. Notice that the only disciple who had a problem with extravagant giving was Judas. And he said it in a righteous way. Ah, oh, I can't believe you would do that and not help the poor. But God knew his heart. His heart didn't care about the poor. His heart cared about his own poor self. He used to help himself to the money in the temple. You say, why, why did you read these three stories? Why, why I wanted to read all three. And there's a fourth one, but for sake of time, I'll just get through three is because many scholars believe that this story is actually two stories about, about two different scenarios in one Bible. They believe that there are two Marys, there are two different, uh, different houses that Jesus went in, and two times where he's anointed. And, and over the years, people have come to believe that. But the more I read this, before they had those two idea thoughts that this Mary and this Mary, they believed that Mary was actually the same Mary in all the stories and, and, and it was the same house and it happened once to Jesus and somewhere along the line they threw that away and went to this two story thing. Well, the reason why I say that is because I believe it has so much more power if you understand it as one story told in two different ways. The Bible says that there was a sinful woman named Mary. Well, the only sinful woman we know in the Bible named Mary is not Mother Mary. It's Mary Magdalene. And the Bible says of Mary Magdalene that she followed Jesus and she was actually not just sinful. She was a, a lady boss. And in fact, after she was led to the Lord, she helped fund the ministry of Jesus she was a part of a whole group of ladies. Some, some people don't know this, but they think Jesus just went around and multiplied money and multiplied bread. And, and he did do those things. He pulled a, a coin out of a fish's mouth. He, 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 he took a small boy's lunch and fed thousands. But there were also moments where these women that were following the ministry of the apostles would fund Jesus's ministry. In fact, when the Holy Spirit shows up in the book of Acts, it's in the upper room. You ever heard that? If a house had an upper room, it wasn't a middle-class family or a lower-class family. It was the upper class that had a second roof on their thing. So the house where the Holy Spirit shows up is actually of, of a person that's a king on this earth that is using what he has or what she has to help fuel the kingdom. And so this woman, Mary Magdalene, the Bible says also that Jesus delivered her of seven demons. Now... You know, I've seen a person with one demon. And I'm like, man, I could do, need some help. Praise God. Deliverance. And, and if you have any demons living on board, we want to help you get out of that, right? We don't, we, we don't want you to have to live with demons living on board, on the inside. But Mary had seven different demons. Jesus delivers her. And so it would make sense that, that Mary, that when Jesus, she gets in and they're judging her and the Pharisees in the house are judging uh, this, this act of generous worship, this act of generosity to God, it would make sense uh, that, that Jesus turns and says this to everyone. He says, look, let me tell you a story. There are two people. One person owes about $5 to me. Another owes about $5 million to me. 
They both couldn't pay it. One didn't have five and the other didn't have five million. It was still an equal debt in their mind. But obviously, the one that I received grace on for $5 wasn't as excited as the one who I gave grace on for five million. He explains that story. He said, obviously, the one who has been forgiven greatly loves even greatly, right? And so you understand that. You'll hear people in this room, amen. And you, you don't, don't judge their praise. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what God forgave them of. You'll see people jumping up and down, crying at this altar. Don't say, oh, they're just emotional. You, no, you don't know what, God, what hell God walked them out of. Don't judge someone else's praise because you don't know what they've been through. Maybe you haven't been through that much. Maybe God didn't bring you. Maybe you got saved a $5 saving, but it was a $5 million for me. So I'm going to praise him anyways with you watching. Amen. So it makes sense, but, but, but I, think, I think the story goes deeper because it also says that, 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 that one, one says the house, of a, the house of a Pharisee, which was the separatist, the elite people, and another version says the house of a leper. So you know what leprosy was back in the day when they would have great sin in their life, it would reflect in their body. And so if you had leprosy, it was a skin-eating disease that ate away at the bones and the marrow and the organs of your body till you were no longer a person. Your eye would just start getting eaten out into your face, into your mouth. It would take away your life, and it was contagious. And so anyone that contracted leprosy at an older age would have to go live in a leper colony. We've heard of these, right? There are certain islands that they were leper colonies because if I have leprosy and I touch you, what's on me will get on you. And so when someone discovered they had leprosy, they had to leave their home, they had to leave their life, they had to leave their world. And so the Bible tells us that one of the houses is the house owner was Simon the leper and the other house was Simon the Pharisee, Simon the elite and Simon the broken. So, so they can't be the same house. It can't be the same Mary because it also tells us that one of the houses was, was Mary, Mary was there and Martha were there with Lazarus. So that's Mary and Martha's sister. So the Mary that was at Jesus' feet worshiping and doing the right thing, this can't be the same sinful Mary who seven demons came out of for her to worship like that. So theology, we've built this theology that's just got to be two different houses because we just can't put the, our brains can't put the two together. Even though it's super weird that someone would walk into a house twice, break an alabaster bottle, worship, wet his feet with their tears, wipe her hair with their tears. It's weird that it happens once and it's super weird that it happens twice. And then that Jesus says, wherever the story of this woman is, the gospel is told, the story of this woman will be preached. It blows Jesus away so much that he's like, wherever you preach the gospel, you need to talk about this lady right here. And it happened twice. I'd just like you to take a journey with me to think, what if it just happened once? What if this is the same house? What if the Pharisee was also a leper. And what if Mary that worshiped was also Mary that had struggled with seven demons? What if when Jesus gave the parable about the one who had been forgiven of $5 and the one who had been forgiven of $5 million wasn't as easy to catch as we think? What if the five million wasn't talking about Mary and the five dollars wasn't talking about the Pharisee? But what if the Pharisee was one of the ones that had leprosy when he first met Jesus? Remember the story of the lepers that came to Jesus, the 10 lepers, and they came over to Jesus. How, 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 would he, how would he not have an arm missing or eyes missing, even if Jesus healed him? Well, there's a story of the 10 lepers, and, and nine of them, and 10, 10 of them cry out to God, have mercy on me, heal me. And, and the Bible says that Jesus is not afraid to touch them, is not afraid to get next to them. And Jesus heals the lepers. Nine of the lepers, actually all 10, go to go show themselves to the priest. And here's why they do that. So they can get back to their life. 
they, okay, I'm healed, so I can go back to being a dad. I can go back to my house. I can go back to work. I can go. I, I got what I need from you, Jesus. Now I'm ready to go back to my life. Right? Sound familiar? I got everything I need. Now I don't need God. Right? So they go back to their life. And the Bible says that one of the ten lepers returns to Jesus. Out of the, out of the, out of the ten, only one comes back, and he worships at Jesus' feet. And Jesus says to the one that comes back, he says, where are the other nine? And he says, I don't know. And then Jesus says, well, because of your worship, because of your gratitude, rise. You may be made whole. So the others were cleansed. But the one who returned with generosity for the cleansing was made whole. What does it mean whole? He grew back. His arm grew back. His eyes grew back. His legs grew back. Wherever the disease had taken, it was like just as if it had never. God restored him to the place he was before the sin ever touched him because of generosity. Could it be that no one knows that Simon the Pharisee is actually Simon the leper because there was a moment in his life where he was the one that returned to Jesus? Could it be that he knew the secret of full healing was found in our generous, extravagant worship to Jesus? Could he be the one that was forgiven of five million yet sitting back? Could it be that Jesus was going, hey, remember when I transformed you too? Simon the Pharisee. Oh, you look good now. But I remember a time where you needed me. And yet this woman who only had seven demons in comparison to your rotting life has not stopped kissing my feet from the time I came. And could it be that we that have been in the church a long time have forgotten? Could it be that we've become stingy over life, over time? Could it be that we have forgotten what it really means to be a believer? Could it be that we've forgotten how far he's brought us? Could it be that we have forgotten that he took us out of a place where no one could get us out of? I don't know who's here who's gotten stingy in your presence praise or qualified in your praise or separatists in your praise could it be that we are like Simon we're now called the Pharisee but we're really a leper God brought us out from such a place and if we were here and we really got wrecked by God again we would give him a crazy praise in the middle of all these people saying God I don't care he was trying to remind the Pharisee of how far he had come. Look how professional you are now. Do you remember what I saved you out of? Generosity is a result of remembering what he's brought you from. This is why your testimony is so powerful. Because when you give it, you're reminded of how far God's brought you from. This is why it's so powerful to be in a church where people are getting saved. Because when you see their hand go up, you remember your hand going up. And you remember that moment. This is why it's so important to be in a church where no one has to be perfect to come in. Because when they come in broken and smelling like where you've been, you don't forget how far you've come. And you... Generosity. How much have you been loved should determine how much you love. Wherever the gospel is preached, we'll remember this woman. Because in the midst of the religious, she could give a rip what they thought. Because she knew what time it was. See, they didn't know what time it was because they said, oh, we could have took the nard and the alabaster bottle that's worth a year's wages and we could have took it over here and sold it and fed the poor and helped the needy. And God said, the poor you will have with you always. I know you don't know what time it is, but I'm about to give my life as a Passover lamb. She's anointing my body. You didn't anoint me because you don't know what time it is. Folks, do you know what time it is? 
she knew what time it was. She knew when to plant her seed. She knew when the soil was right. She knew the moment of, of, of change. She, she knew that it was time. See, see I want to tell you this. God didn't need her oil. God didn't need her gift. God didn't need her perfume. God didn't need her worship. He's worshiped with angels sitting around the throne. When John gets to heaven, he sees a hundred thousand times a hundred thousand angels worshiping around the throne on fire. That's a hundred million folks right now. They are louder than us. They're better singers than us. God doesn't need our praise. He doesn't need our time. He doesn't need our treasure. He doesn't need our talent. But when this woman brought it, God honored her because she understood what what time and who she was in front of. Do you know who you're in front of today? God doesn't need our stuff. Look at this in, in, in Psalms chapter 50, verse 10. It says, all of the animals in the forest are mine. And all the cattle on a thousand hills. Psalms 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's. It's number 10 and 11 in my notes. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all his people. That's the first one. For the beast, every beast of the forest, mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. What about the second one? You got that one? For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. I'll just read. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. What we need to understand today is everything we have is actually God's. When you get that, you get, I'm dealing with something that's not mine. It helps you to be more generous with God when you realize that what you're holding is his. Where's Matt? Matt, come here, come here. Okay, come here. I need a few guys. Come, I need a few guys. Just run up. Just here. I'm going to give you a cup when you run up. I'm going to put a million dollars in these cups, so whoever wants to come up, come on up, come on up. Okay. Okay. Good. Some men of God right here. Come on. There we go. We got some sons of thunder. It's okay. There we go. I only got a few more. I only got a few more. Oh, you got two cups. There we go. Pass those out to our brothers right there. Okay. So, and then I got my wife. Come here, honey. It's my wife. Can I have one of those cups back? I'm sorry. Everything. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't plan this right. Okay. So, so God's saying, look, I'm going to give you breath. I'm going to give you life. Fill it up enough to get everyone a, a little bit there. Give me, you can give each different amounts, whatever you want to do. So God comes along. He gives you breath. He gives you life. He gives you, he gives you resources. He gives you stuff. He gives you, he, everything's his. This water is whose? Whose water is it? Whose life is it? Whose breath is it? Whose water? This, this is his. Everything belongs to him. Okay, so then he leaves his bride. He leaves his bride and he says, look, guys, you're my mighty men. I've given you what I have. I've given you breath. I've given you life. I've given I, everything you have in that container. You have the container, but what I've put in it is mine. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave my wife here. And I, I need some mighty men that I've given myself to to take care of her. I need you to take what I've given you, and if she needs something, I need you to give her some of it. Here's what I'm going to require. Every one of you at least give 10% of what I give. It's a requirement. If you don't do that, I'm going to come hunting for you at the end. Right? And if I had the power to give you this, what do I have the power to do? Take it away. But to those that want to be like me, you can give more. And whatever you give, I'm going to give what you gave, and then I'm going to give it in abundance to a place of running over. So you decide. But when she's in need, I need you to help. So I go away. And my wife says, I have a need. 
We're trying to reach this area of the city, the bride of Christ. And you say, well, man, I'd love to give, but I'm just, I'm thirsty, man. I've been drinking a lot of, I've been drinking what you gave, God gave me. I, 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 got, I got a lot of stuff to do. I got, I'm busy. Um, and then she comes out, I'm in need. The, the, the kids, we need an AC in here so these kids don't sweat their face off and they can have a great time. Oh, you know, I, I got a need. I got, I, I, I got something I got to feel. I, I wish I could help. I wish I could be a part of it. Hey, hey, we got a, we got an area. We need someone to serve in. We, we need some time over here. We, 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 the bride, you know, we need some servants that will let people in with their cars and, and love on them when they come in oh man I would love to do that but I'm just real busy I'm in LA you know what I'm saying I'm trying to grind it out I'm trying to be a pro actor and in a pro pro you know I'm, I'm doing big things and so we're drinking our life and three years later I come back and I find my wife with an empty cup I find my wife starving and in, and, and 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 she can't hardly make it one more day she's just she's just limping and hobbling how do you think I'm going to talk to these guys? What if one of these guys decides, you know what? I'm going all in. What if one of these guys decides to leave the crowd like the woman with the alabaster bottle and say, you know what? I, I believe God for what he said. I believe that if I'm generous with his bride, that he'll be generous with me. And God says, good. Go fill that thing up. Go fill that thing up. We got, we got, we got, a, we, we got one that believed us. I know your cup is empty right now, but, but I'm a man of my word because my name, my, my name is, is dependent upon my word. And you're only as good as your word. Your name is only as good as your word. So I promise that if, if you will refresh others, I will refresh you. If you, you will give out, I, I will pour in, press down, shaking together, and running over, running over, running over. See, everybody else is trying to hold what they had because they forgot that God is also going to take care of them, but it's all a test. This is called, this is called stewardship. When you're carrying something that's not yours, it's not ownership. It's stewardship. God is looking for good stewards. What did he say? Good job. My good and faithful steward, steward right? He doesn't say good job. My good and faithful owner. He says, good job, my good and faithful steward. Why? Because you are a good steward of what wasn't yours. Your time's not yours. Your talent's not yours. Your breath isn't yours. Your finances isn't yours. It's God's. And so here we go. Come here, man. Come here. God, we're going to bless you, bro. Feel it overflowing. Just keep pouring. 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 God says, press down, shaking together, and running over. So all these guys go, man, I want some of this. Come on, get me around this guy. This guy, there's, there's, come on, come up. You want some of this? You got to get around him. You got to get around him. You got to get, see, there's, there's something about someone who's a generous person. It draws people around you because you have a well running through you and around you. See, one generous believer in this room will spark a revival in the city of Los Angeles because when it works with him or her, it will work with you. You serve a generous God. Why are we still holding it back? This bride should not have one need. There should be nothing broken in this Right. There should be nothing not ready in this. There should not be one spot not filled. Because everything we have is his. What are you doing, pastor? I'm just joining Jesus. Coming and trimming the bush around. Come and put some fertilizer. Thank you, guys. Careful walking off. We don't need a lawsuit. I don't have any seed to sow. Everyone has a seed. It's not that you don't have a seed to sow. It's that most of us are sowing in the wrong place. Me, myself, and I. Mounting debt. And God says the only place where the seed grows is in my soil. 
if you sow here, you have a hundredfold. Let's, let me ask this. How, how many, if this was an apple seed, which it's not, but if it was, how many apples are in the seed? Unlimited. One seed put in one soil produces a tree that results in unlimited apples, which ultimately results in unlimited seeds. My Bible says that God gives seed to the sower. Many of my years I thought when I sow, God puts them in my back pocket. So God puts, no, no. He gives you seed. And where do your future seeds come from? From the tree in the fruit of the seeds you sowed. Because in, see, why does it matter? Because one takes away all the work. One's just like, I give, and where's it at? Where's it at, God? Where's it at? It's supposed to come right now. God says, no, there's seasons. I've given you seed, and watch, just wait. I know you sowed one seed. Watch it be a thousand. But it's going to have to produce fruit that you steward. All of us have seed. Some have less. Some have more. To much is given, much is required. So don't be mad at the guy that has more. You got less required. <laughs> You're like, oh, thank God, I only got two seeds. I'm just required of that. He's got 10,000. I'm going to take what I have. What's your seed? It's your treasure. Why does God want your treasure? My Bible says, for wherever your treasure is, your heart will be also. God doesn't want your stuff. He doesn't need American dollars. In fact, on the dollar it says, in God we trust. Do we really? Should we cross that out? Because many times in my life, I'm sowing into things that doesn't look like I trust God. Because when I trust him, I, I sow there. I sow my time, my talent, my resources. In God we trust not in this mammon, not in this world. If you want more seed, according to the Bible, what should you do? So, it's as simple as that. Anybody want more seed? I mean, you'd be silly to say, no, no, I don't want any more seed. What's wrong with you? Get out of that poverty mindset. Yeah, I want more seed because I want more fruit. And I want more fruit to feed more people. Do you know this bride right here, we fed over 4 million pounds of food outside these doors in the last couple of years. We're clothing people. Now we're giving people haircuts. We've seen thousands of people give their life to Christ in this room. We've seen thousands of people delivered because somebody sowed a seed that turned into fruit that turned into more seed. You are the fruit of someone's seed. Think about that. You're only here, and I'm only here because he first loved us and sowed his life in us. Tithing. Tithing. I think tithing, why don't we do that in all areas? Why don't we tithe, which means 10% our time? tithe our talent and tithe our resource why don't we think like that and tithing is not not being generous tithing is being obedient generosity starts at 11 percent. because god doesn't ask for that he says you pray about that so what is a tithe of our time what's 10 percent of 24 hours Right? So, so wake up every day. Create time for God. If you don't create time for God, how's God going to produce in your life? God wants to change the world through your life, but there's no time. What if you took two hours and 24 minutes of your day and said, God, that's yours. No one else's. I'm not spending this on me. I'm not even going to ask you for things for me. I'm just going to seek your face and whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. That's your time. I work for you. It's yours. Right? That should free a lot of people up to serve. That should free a lot of people up to say, man, what, Pastor Dave, what do you need? What can we do? How can we reach the city? Man, there are ministries to be started. 
There are, there are people to be reached. There are areas where my voice won't reach where your voice might. Right? I think, I think of Kat right here and the whole crew that started a dance ministry over in this corner and just to do it for the love of dance and the love of people. And now hundreds of people have given their life to Christ through this dance ministry that happens. But she just said, and, and they just said, we're going to sow our time. It's, we don't care. We don't need to get noticed. I don't need someone. I don't need to get a degree to do that. I don't need to be a pro Christian to do that. I'm going to start where I'm at and God's going to use where I'm at. I'm going to see the fruit of it. Let me ask this question. Who's come to this church because of that dance ministry? Let me see your hand. I know there are probably got to be a, a couple of y'all. Anybody come to this church because of that? I see one up there. Amen. Praise God. I know there are more right here, right here too. Okay, cool. I mean, right over here. You started a run, a run club, right? I mean, there were like 30, 40 people there getting their body healthy, their temple, but also having community, which is something you saw a need. And you say, you know what, God, I don't got all this time. I got a full-time job. I got a wife. I got life. I got business. But he said, you know what, God, I'm just going to give you a few hours of my time. What can you do with it? What if you tithe your time? And then what if you tithe your talent? You took two hours and 24 minutes and you took your talent and you said, this is yours, Lord whether for the bride or just out, outside these walls, as the bride of Christ out there. You say, okay, and I, I know you're doing that. I, I see it every day. You're not a pastor or a preacher, but every day you guys get together and every single day you do a devotion on your Instagram for the world to say, you say, no, pastor, I don't know who's watching or who isn't watching it, but I just feel like the Lord's told me to do it. So I'm giving my time to pour into this. And that takes time to study and get ready. And you didn't wake up wanting to be a speaker, but you said, hey, if no one's going to do it, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to be faithful to God. And look at what God's done in your ministry and your life and your kid. And, and, and I believe your kid's going to become doing the same thing. I mean, there are so many people that have just said, you know what, God, I could go around this audience all day, but I'm already 14 minutes over and the food truck is here. And one more, Val, this guy right here has a prayer meeting every, look, stand up, Val. Let them see you in person. How cool is he? He has a prayer meeting that he does every Monday night, I think, Monday. Yeah, Monday and Friday now. It just keeps going. And it's like all night. I mean, as long as, long as you want to pray, he's going to pray with you. But Val has been faithful. Every Monday and Friday night, he texts me. You want to come pray? And if I go in there, man, they will pray for me for hours, and they will believe with people. And these are not like average prayers. These are people that know how to pray. Like, I mean, their prayers sound like poems. I'm like, that's a poem right there. Just put that. That's a worship song. And so, man, they're giving their time. Your talent and your resource. Tithing is in the Old and the New Testament. In Matthew, Jesus confronts the Pharisees because they tithe over a, a deal mint. They cut their mint and tithe. And he said, you've neglected the greater things of the law, mercy and justice. So don't tithe and neglect mercy and justice. He said, you should have done both. You should have tithed and embraced mercy and justice. So tithing's in the Old Testament, New Testament. It's, it's an obedient thing, okay? So we tithe our time, we tithe our, our talent, we tithe our resources, right? That's how it, you just take whatever you get paid, you take 10%. Look, at the restaurant today, you feel bad if you don't give the waiter 18%. I mean, now it's not just the restaurant, it's everywhere you go. <laughs> it's like you buy something at CVS and they're like, where's the tip? But yeah, we can't give God 10% and we want to argue over that. Look, start with 10% and then go to 11 and that's generosity. To, to those that have been forgiven much, love much. It's the greatest investment you will ever make. I can attest to that in my personal life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Fearless Online Church. Man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deeds. This church is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. 
fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on, somebody, that's a lot of food. We, we gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, uh, pretty much the modern day uh, version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending in a sense to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life that no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more, no matter how much I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their heart so God can meet their spiritual need. Would you help us do that? We wanna give out more clothing. We wanna give out more food. We wanna to touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out 4 million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? Would you become a partner today? Everything in life to get anywhere really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth. Who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life. That love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're gonna partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the Fearless Partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are so into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, amen.